On the evening of November 13th, 2015, Paris was shaken by a series of coordinated attacks. 129 people were killed, hundreds more wounded, an ambience of fear gripped the country. Terrorists could strike anywhere, at any time. Nothing was safe. Even the smallest venue could be targeted. It might be tempting to react to this event emotionally without looking beyond the official narrative, without examining the evidence, without questioning where this is headed. You wouldn't be alone, but blind indignation lends itself to easy answers, half-truths, and comforting lies. Anytime a population is attacked or believes that they have been attacked by an outside force, the reaction is as predictable as it is dangerous. New wars and totalitarian laws that would have been unthinkable just days before are easily justified. Voices of reason are drowned out, and entire nations can be driven towards a cliff. Given the nature of this particular cliff, it would behoove you to look a little deeper this time. There are several moving parts to the story. The Syrian war, ISIS and the push to remove Assad from power, the expansion of a militarized police state throughout Europe, and of course, the refugee crisis. All of which has been conveniently tied together by a passport carried by a suicide bomber passport which miraculously survived the blast, unscathed. Never mind the fact that Germany's interior minister came forward to say that he had reason to suspect that the passport had been planted. Let's deconstruct this one piece at a time. Without even looking beyond mainstream sources, we find evidence that the French government knew that the attacks were coming. They were warned by the Iraqi government, they were warned by the Turkish government twice, and according to this article from the Times of Israel, which has since been edited, security officials in Paris were specifically warned of an impending attack that very morning. And of course, the French government just happened to be running an exercise simulating a mass shooting in Paris just hours before the attacks began. Could someone please explain how Iraq and Turkey, which are developing countries, were able to see this coming while the NSA and French intelligence were caught completely off guard? Are we really to believe that this was just incompetence? Before the dust had even settled, the official narrative was clear. ISIS was responsible. This was war, and France was going to escalate that war both at home and abroad. A state of emergency was declared. Roadblocks, border controls, and a curfew were imposed. Freedom of assembly was restricted, and the military was deployed on the streets. French President François Hollande soon announced that he intended to extend the state of emergency for three months and to alter the French constitution. The state of emergency gives the police the power to detain people without trial, search without warrants, and to block any website they see fit. These powers are already being used. Activists have been placed under house arrest, and not for crimes that they have been accused of actually committing, but preemptively. The attacks are also being used as a pretext to justify the establishment of a new European intelligence agency, modeled after the CIA. And speaking of the CIA, let's not forget who actually created ISIS. France didn't seem too concerned about the rise of Islamic extremism when they joined the US in the 2011 regime change operation in Libya. If mainstream news outlets were publishing evidence of jihadists among the CIA-backed rebels, it would be utterly naive to think that the French intelligence services didn't know. France also didn't seem to mind the fact that Islamic extremists were receiving the lion's share of the weapons that were looted from Gaddafi's armories and shipped through Turkey into Syria. France didn't stand up or speak out for years as the US government continued arming, funding, and training these extremists. There was no righteous indignation at the atrocities they were committing. There were no calls for criminal proceedings after those same rebels got caught using sarin gas against thousands of civilians. And the French government has never so much as verbally condemned the numerous state actors which have been caught assisting ISIS and or its allies logistically. Why? Because ISIS serves a purpose. ISIS and its associates Al-Nusra and the FSA are weakening the Syrian government, creating a pretext for a military intervention, and providing the perfect excuse for a massive power grab on the home front. Oh, that's not fair to equate the FSA with ISIS. Those are the moderate rebels. Really? Then explain this away. ISIS and al-Nusra have officially formed alliances. FSA commanders have gone on record to say that they cooperate with and conduct joint operations with al-Nusra. And it has been well established that the FSA command is dominated by Islamic extremists. Do the math. أما فيما يخص بعض الفصائل التي مثلا يطالب الغرب بتصنيفها كمنظمات إرهابية جبهة النصرة. نعم. نحن نشعر أن هذه الجبهة بمكان ما هي يمكن الحوار معها حول حول نعم سو حول طبيعة الدولة القادمة حول شكل الدولة القادمة حول إمكانية هذه البلد على إقامة دولة التي تناسب الجميع نحن في مكان ما يجب أن نتعاون ويجب أن نتحاور وأنا على صلة بالجميع أنا على صلة بالجميع وعلى أخذ سر بذلك 
حتى فيما يخص يعني الاخوة في جبهة النصرة ونتعاون في امكنة كثيرة. What's happening in France should not be viewed in isolation. Xenophobic sentiment has been on the rise throughout Europe and is gaining ground politically. This trend has clearly been exacerbated by the ongoing migrant crisis, which is obviously tied to the regime change policies of the West. But one variable in this equation that no one is talking about is the fact that the way immigration has been handled in Europe is not merely a question of short-sightedness, it is a reflection of policy. In 2012, UN Migration Chief Peter Sutherland urged the EU to, quote, do its best to undermine the homogeneity of its member states. Such a proposition may sound absurd unless you take into account that breaking down the national identity of a country makes it much easier to dissolve political boundaries and independence. And that's precisely what the technocrats in Brussels want. Hollande has been one of the most outspoken voices in this push to hand over more power to a centralized European government, effectively stripping member states of any meaningful sovereignty. Give that European government a military, its own surveillance apparatus, and a public which is struggling financially, looking for someone to blame, and practically begging for a war, and you have a recipe for the rise of overt fascism in Europe. Many have remarked that recent moves by the French president take several pages from the extreme right. Some have interpreted this as an attempt to prevent the right from capitalizing on the event, but it hasn't worked out that way at all. Taken on its own, one might be inclined to interpret this as a political miscalculation. But what if it's not? Hollande's actions don't make much sense if we view him as an independent leader, but they make perfect sense if you understand that he's just a puppet. The powers he seized following the Charlie Hebdo and Paris attacks are not suited for the political left. The left is held back by the need to maintain a soft-spoken, inclusive veneer. Those rising up to replace them will not be. The right will not scale back these powers. They will expand them, and they will use them even more than they're being used now. It's the left-right, left-right, two-step to tyranny. This formula is not new. These tactics are not original, nor are the motives or response. Like the American public following 9-11, it's going to take the European population quite some time to realize where they're being led. And they're only going to come to that realization if those who see what's happening have the courage to speak out. And make no mistake, this is just the beginning. They'll take it as far as you let them. This video is Creative Commons. You have permission to download and distribute any and all of our content through any venue, commercial or non-commercial. If you want more people to see this information, please remember to like, share, and comment. If you want to see how far the rabbit hole really goes, keep in touch. Subscribe to Stormclouds Gathering on YouTube, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+, and you can sign up for email notifications of new releases on our website, stormcloudsgathering.com.